The following contains spoilers. Monday. Bat Monday. Can we call it Bat Monday or would that have been last Monday? No, Lots this counts as Bat Monday. Lots to discuss here on Digital Charcuterie. Manic Monday. I'm James. Joining me today is Andrew from the Andrew Fantasia YouTube channel and also on Rebel Scout Podcast. Lots to, to dive into today. Of course, like I said... We always have fun here on Digital Charcuterie, and if you are new to the channel, the way it works is on Monday and Fridays, we just have a grab bag of topics that we discuss. On Tuesdays, we are live with all superhero talk. We're live Tuesdays and Fridays on the channel. Monday, or we do another show. There's a live chat. Have fun with it, whatever you want. If you have a question for us to discuss, email us at digitalcharcuterie at gmail.com. I thank everybody who has sent in email questions. I've been getting so many of them. It's awesome. It gives us stuff to talk about. That's not just what I want to talk about. Usually it is still because we all want to talk about the same thing, especially right now with Batman being such a big deal in the box office, but it's, it means a lot to me. And thank you to all the new subscribers. And it's, it's been amazing to see. I'm kind of mind blown right now. <laughs> Stop doing this for like four years and you are all you know, coming back. So thank you for that. And Andrew, thank you for joining me today on Manic Monday. Thank you for having me. It's a rule of thumb, James. You put out a charcuterie board of any kind, digital or no, and people will flock to it. That's how it works. Charcuter yeah, charcuterie is a big uh, big business. People love love the charcuterie. So the way things are, is we have uh, email questions we're going to go through and a bunch of other topics that we just want to talk about today. So let's get right to our first email topic, Mr. Fantasia. And our first email topic today is, have you seen the new Batgirl pics of Brendan Fraser's Firefly? He looks sort of like Rat Catcher meets the Riddler. What do you think? Thanks for answering my email, Kimberly Bronte. Uh, I have seen them, Andrew. I've seen these pictures. I'll put them on the screen. Here they are right here. I think I like the way he looks. He does look a little bit like Rat Catcher. Uh, you're not wrong, but I really enjoy this. I've seen the behind the scenes stuff. I don't know if you have, Andrew, of Brendan Fraser walking out of an explosion of a building on fire, the fire truck scene with Batgirl chasing him. It all looks like a lot of fun. I, you know, we talk about this on this channel a lot. This Batgirl movie is one that I am uh, psyching myself up for more and more. Probably not good, uh, good of me to do that. Probably it's an HBO Max show or movie. So we'll see. But I think this looks actually really cool. I think it's, it is a down to earth grounded uh, looking firefly I guess, but it, it seems cool and it seems like it's working and it fits with the vibe, especially of the vibe and aesthetic of the costume we saw that Batgirl's going to have. So I'm all in on this. I think it looks great. I thought the same thing, Kimberly, when I saw this for the first time. Yeah, he's got that old uh, World War II era kind of radiation helmet going on there. It's very Ratcatcher-esque. Uh, but I like the idea of Firefly like hiding his face because his face is all messed up because he's been in way too many fires. Uh, one fire is one fire too many. So I like the idea that he is sort of hiding what he looks like uh, and saving it for a big kind of Anakin Skywalker-esque reveal at some point in the movie. I don't think we've gotten pics of Brendan Fraser's face yet, have we? Uh, there has been some behind the scenes stuff that we have seen, yes, and he just looks like Brendan Fraser. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, but that might have been. I don't know if that is how he's going to look in the final product or not. But I think it is. So I think it's just going to be his face, from what I can tell. So I don't. I don't know. Well, I've been telling you from day one, this would be a lot better movie if it was a secret George of the Jungle sequel. And so far, I see no proof that it isn't. It's not. You know, it, Brendan Fraser's first uh, few movies were Encino Man, George of the Jungle, and what was his other? Uh, yeah, uh, well, Dudley do right. But his first two movies, he didn't even speak. He just played the unspeaking, I mean, school tie shirt, but, or school, yeah, school, sure. But uh, George of the Jungle and Encino Man, they were like, we, he's got something here. But now he's like the most beloved actor uh, of them all. Him and Keanu Reeves, who was voicing Batman in the Super Pets uh, cartoon movie, <laughs> are the two most beloved actors ever. And both of them grew up in Toronto area, Ontario. Brendan Fraser grew up in Toronto? I don't know, but he wore a Leaf jersey on Saturday Night Live in the late <laughs> 90s, so I'm just going to go with it. I'm excited for Batgirl. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I think there's a reason why Michael Keaton showed up, why Brandon, Brandon Fraser, I mean, you know, maybe he just wants to do it. He's in Doom Patrol, obviously. Maybe this is something that he wanted to do. I think the script might have something, to be honest. I, I'm very intrigued to see 
the first trailer. I'm not intrigued to see the, the YouTube comments for the first trailer, but oh. I'm intrigued to see the first trailer. I am very excited for this whole, just the whole thing about it. Like, first of all, a Batgirl movie is exciting. And then to add to it, you have this villain who's like, the hopes of seeing him anywhere else were pretty, like, it was slim. Like, we were never going to get, Firefly is going to be the villain in Christopher Nolan's fourth movie. Like, that was never going to be a thing. So to finally see Firefly, a guy like Firefly, who's C-list Batman villain, maybe, pop up in this and to finally get like a big screen version of him, even though it is HBO Max and have him still flying around Gotham and to top it all off, you've got Keaton. That sounds to me like this is a special movie. This really feels like a special movie and it feels like it's our first sort of, how do I put this? Like our first movie that's acknowledging the wider world of Gotham. I think DC, I think you're right. And DC's got something on their hands with these lesser characters. We saw with Peacemaker, Suicide Squad. They mm-hmm. say, when you give it to the right combination of writers, directors, and whatnot, obviously James Gunn did it all for Peacemaker. But when you give it to people who care, they can utilize these C-list characters and, and elevate them to A-list. Like Peacemaker is now on the top of people's list for favorite superhero, right? Like that's that's not easy to achieve, especially a character like that. But they were able to make that happen because of a, a writer, director who cared and had a passion for it. <laughs> and a lot of these D-list, I mean, Marvel, the whole Mar- MCU was built on B-list superheroes. Let's be honest, right? Like mm-hmm. who, I, you know, the Hulk maybe during the time. Now things have changed, obviously, but... Iron Man was a B-lister for sh- like he is the quintessential B-list superhero who has elevated himself to probably above A-list now. You know, it was like Spider-Man, Batman were top tier, and then uh, who else did they? You know, Thor B C list maybe he was around there. He's Thor, Captain above. America. Like no, yeah. no kids in nineteen ninety five were having Captain America parties. Like it was no, happening. no. I never cared for Captain America, and then Winter Soldier blew my mind. So <laughs> I think I think the the one thing too is. For DC is when you use these lesser characters, you have a lot more free range too, because all of a sudden people don't know too much about them. They don't care too much about them and you throw them in. And it, it's really, it's an exciting time to be a comic book movie fan. It's an exciting time to be a DC fan because the MCU has got their feet firmly planted on what they do. And I think DC has now figured out what they're going to do. We're going to talk about it a little bit later on the show, but they're very like secure now and what their mission is even though it might not make any sense, but they're, <laughs> they seem pretty secure. And I think using these mid tier, lower tier villains, heroes is brilliant. Even bad girl, bad girls, you know, B list. She's probably up there with not as she's probably up there. Like C. she's higher than C. I'd go B with Iron Man prior to the MCU. She was up there. She was another character. Everyone knew and respected sidekick. I think using her, I think DC using her as their Batman and Batman being like her mentor and then leading up to what Scotty Hawk likes to say on this channel to the Gotham Knights. I think that's the way you do this yeah. over here because now you have the Batman. The Batman has come out. It's huge. It's the Reeves verse, right? Reeves is going to create a whole universe around Batman. And uh, I was thinking actually this weekend, I was thinking, you know, Batman, Spider-Man and X-Men don't need to be part of bigger universes. No, because they they're don't. like their universes are already so rich. Like they have. And, I, and, and when Matt Reeves, said it i didn't think anything of it then thinking back on the reeves verse and his i'm like no no batman is the mc like it's its own mcu you've got everything you need within there that you can keep growing and expanding so i think the dceu whatever that means but the batgirl world that it's living in makes sense to be separate from this one use her as like your base and then everything can grow around it because you know the batman stuff over there and leave this here and and i i think the future is so bright and i really really hope this movie uh, pans out and is a hit. Oh, I hope so. I hope it builds that pocket of the DCEU in a fun way. And it comes at it in that Marvel way where it's like, we're going to introduce you to this pocket, but not through the all-star that you're familiar with. We're going to introduce you through the Iron Man character, you know, through the mm-hmm. character who's like not a hundred percent. Like there are, I would say maybe unless you're like crazy sweaty into DC there's a good chance most people don't know that Batgirl is a separate entity from Batwoman. 
that they're two people, mm -hmm. two different, completely different characters. Uh, and it's just be, it, like, it's, it's not their fault. It's not like, oh, they're not real fans. It's just those two characters just don't get all the love they deserve. I mean, Batwoman's got a show uh, that I haven't seen yet because I'm still working my way through those DC shows. There's a lot of them. Uh, but there's not a whole lot of spotlight shined on those characters, especially in recent years. Uh -huh. Like, when's the last time anybody saw Batgirl on screen? 1966, <laughs> right? Uh, Batman and Robin. Robin and Robin, right, sorry, yeah. I totally forgot about her. So, so, and she wasn't even wearing purple. So it's like, was no. she even a really bad girl? Um, that's going to change, I hope. I hope we get to a point in two years from now that that movie is so well received that the same way all our moms know who Iron Man is, all our moms are gonna know, yeah, Batgirl is one person and Batwoman is another person and they both do their own thing in Gotham City. I want to live in that world because that means we have explored depths of Gotham that we've never gotten to see before. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Gotham is so rich with every aspect of it. And I'm excited to see what they're bringing forward. And I'm hoping that these, these mid-level tiers on DC can be pushed up the ranks. Like Marvel did such a fantastic job. All it takes is, you know, with Iron Man, I don't know who wrote the Iron Man, the first Iron Man. I apologize, but John Favreau was obviously in there, and he loved it. And Kevin Feige was so hard in there, right? And he loved it. And Feige had a goal, a game plan. But what you needed to get to that game plan was a starting off point, and that first movie had to hit. And Iron Man, the irony of Iron Man, I mm -hmm. should say, is it came out the exact same year as The Dark Knight, and it was so horribly overshadowed by The Dark Knight that I remember talking to friends about the movies. I'm like, and I would. Andrew of all the people would be me and I'd be the one arguing like but Iron Man was fantastic because everyone's like Dark Knight's the greatest movie ever I'm like yeah but Iron Man was also like it was fantastic and you know I wasn't taking anything away from the Dark Knight because that's a fantastic movie but Iron Man was a more fantastic superhero movie and it was Iron Man of all characters it didn't exactly. it didn't it didn't need to rest on the Joker or Heath Ledger's performance it had Robert Downey Jr. knocking it out of the ballpark but it was Iron Man like it was like I watched that cartoon in the 90s sure and I had a couple comics from the early 90s but it, it was Iron Man like no one cared about Iron Man and you know he you know when you got an Iron Man comic I was like yeah I just grabbed this because you know whatever but 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 this movie was fantastic and got overshadowed by the Dark Knight and the and what I always find funny is that was like the turning point in superhero movies where somehow you know the dark and gritty stuff kind of went so to the side and MCU was like, no, we're going to bring back the hope of superhero movies and color and all that stuff. And it, But it was weird that like, that it was almost like this peak of like, Dark Knight was the peak of like this, the, because Batman begins to me like ruin movies for a long time because everything was like, <laughs> it's got to be grounded in reality. It's like, no! And then Iron Man was the one that kind of broke away from that mold. It's like, But even Iron Man 1 was still somewhat grounded in reality to a degree like an iron man reality like it still had to live with an iron man and then when thor showed up they were like all bets are off yeah to a degree what like iron, iron man was never afraid to have a vivid color palette and it was never no. afraid to like inject fun into every possible nook and cranny you could find and i mean you talk about like yeah what a summer that was right from may to july we had those two completely disparate movies uh and but like the overshadowing you're right i totally forgot how much iron man because back then it was there was no mcu yet so it's not like was everybody nothing. was like yeah. no one even no one even knew to stay for an end credit scene at that point no that was just a rumor people were like yeah. i think there's a scene we, and i mean we can't uh, like I, I can't overstate this enough yes you got keith letters joker arguably one of the best jokers that's ever been shown to us but on the flip side of that you got Jeff Bridges coming along, giving us a comic book character that people cared about and knew about even less than Iron Man. And to this day, James, he is still in my top five Marvel villains. Really? Yeah. The, I, he was a good, he was actually a really good villain. The problem with that villain is every villain in Marvel after that was this, that villain. That was, <laughs> that was the problem was, but this is the thing when we talk about the Batverse anyway, is like, and Batgirl can utilize it is Batman and Spider-Man have the best villains of all the comic book characters mm -hmm. ever. And the Marvel, other than that, like Marvel's got a couple other ones, obviously Dr. Doom and stuff like that. But like, there's not, you know, 
I, I couldn't name you an Ant Man villain. <laughs> Do you know? I mean, Superman has Lex Luthor, but that's a you know, brainiac. So yeah, utilize it. Make Bad Girl good. Just make Bad Girl good. If that's all we're asking, make it good. For me, it looks like it's going to be good. Do you? So we talk on this channel on Tuesdays about superheroes. Scotty Hot really wants this movie to be like a heart, like an R-rated, almost dark, gritty, bloody. How do you feel? How would you like the tone of this Batgirl movie to go? No, I don't want it to be R-rated. Um, I I don't know how old Batgirl is supposed to be. I don't know if she's like eighteen or if she's you know thirty. Uh, like how how literal are we talking when we say the word Batgirl? I'm hoping she's in her twenties. 20s sounds right to me. Yeah. Um, That's like, right. Uh, like to see. like how, she, how old she was basically in the Adam West show. Like yeah. She seemed like she was early 20s, you know, just out of college, whatever. Um, I don't mind if it's dark because I feel like Gotham should be dark. Um, but I don't no, I don't want like a super brooding R-rated. I don't want this to feel like the Batman. Uh, I'd much rather it feel a bit more heightened, a bit less realistic because the DCEU is like that and it has kind of made its mark being about things that are a little off kilter from humanity. Like it's it's about people who are basically gods. So even though she doesn't have powers and Firefly doesn't have powers, I, I'd rather see it be a heightened, pulpy, comic booky kind of thing where we see just lots of Gotham world building. That's what I want to see. Lots of the world building of, of uh, you know, just walking down the street and, and seeing like graffiti that says like Two-Face rules. You know, I just want stuff that shows us that this is a rich, thick Gotham and we're just dipping our finger in the milkshake. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know how I feel about the rating. I love Peacemaker. And I don't think it would be the same R as Peacemaker. And I, I don't know what an R really means other than blood and swearing and maybe some nudity. And we're not going to get nudity in, in a superhero movie. Well, I shouldn't say that. We're not going to get nudity in a a uh, family character. Peacemaker, you're going to get all you want. Suicide Squad, mm-hmm. sure. But like in the Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, that kind of, you're not going to get nudity. Blood, maybe. And swearing every once in a while. But... You know, I, I loved Logan, but there was a few times when they threw out the F-bomb and I got taken out of it a little bit. Because I was like, yeah, like just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. And and sometimes I find um, sometimes I find when actors are swearing, it doesn't always feel as natural as it should, especially in a character that has never done that before. Like in, in first class when he swears. Perfect. Oh, it was yeah. perfect. But and, and look, not all the. I'm not saying every time he uses the f bomb in, in Logan, but there was one. There was definitely one that I remember watching in the theater, being like, "Nah, you just did that because you could, not because you needed to." And you know, although Logan, you know, was a great movie, and I needed, the, I think the blood in that one was necessary because that's what you got to do it. And so I'm not sure how I feel about Batgirl right now. I think you know we don't have a ton of strong female superheroes at the moment, right? We're building up uh, Black Widow's sister, kind of. Right. And Kate Bishop's coming. And so I just think, you know, we talked about this with Batman is like, there's no Batman movie for kids anymore. They got to stick to like the cartoons when, like, you know, maybe we need to give something to the kids a little bit, but at the same time, I want to be selfish and give me rated R. All right, let's <laughs> move on. Let's move on, Andrew, to our next email question. The first email question of the day. I see lots of comments comparing this Batman to the dark Knight. I don't think that's fair as both of these movies are very different. I wanted to know your thoughts and how Batman compares to the Dark Knight in your companion, uh, your companion, your opinion. Thanks for taking the time to answer my question. You're welcome, Bridget. Uh, Dark Knight and Batman, Andrew, this is going to be a debate that's going to go on for years and years to come. And I think right now we're too early in the Batman. How many times have you seen the Batman? Just once. Just the once you didn't? Okay. Rob is on his third showing as we speak. Yikes. I, I know. That's that's nine hours of your life, uh, which is great. It's a great movie. But this is going to be the, the debate of debates for a long time for uh, Batman fans. And I think I tweeted out the other day that I don't think we should be comparing them. They're, we can love them both. I don't know why we have to be like, one's better than the other. But that's gonna it's inevitable. Exactly. That's going to happen. Bridget's going to happen. Uh, for me, out of the theater right away, I got to give the nod to this one, the Batman. Um, and and I want to really think about why, Andrew, and I want to explain 
why. And because The Dark Knight is a fantastic movie. Should It wasn't nominated for Best Picture, and then the next year they bumped up the Best Picture nominees to 10 because The Dark Knight got denied. This year, oddly enough, because Spider-Man got rejected, even though I don't think Spider-Man No Way Home should have been nominated for really anything. Well, not anything, but like the Best Picture. Now they're having the fan favorite just so that Spider-Man can, can win it, and it's clearly the front runner, runner because whatever. So they, they, you know, whatever. Everyone loves Spider-Man. I'm not saying that, but it wasn't it was not a best picture movie for there, sure. There should be an Oscar category for holy shit. I can't believe they actually pulled this off. Award. Yeah. That, and that's, that's what, what Spider-Man should win. Yeah. That's what it should. Cause it wasn't a best picture. It was a lot of fun. It's a great movie, but it's not a best picture film by, by any stretch. Mm-hmm. But the dark Knight, I think was, I think the dark Knight was, and I think this Batman is as well, but this Batman gets the edge for me. Um, very slight. It's a very slight edge. And this is probably, I've only seen it the one time also. So time is going to tell. And I might backtrack this in four months, like you said, and come out and I completely hate this movie on every level. And I do think this movie is 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 going to get overhyped and it's gonna get um it's gonna get over scrutinized as well because of of how well how good it is, right? Because it's it, it's really good, but it's really good here. It's not really good here, and that's there's gonna be a dividing line for people who like this movie, right? It's not fun like Spider-Man No Way Home. Um, but the reason why for me, Andrew, this is going to get the Batman will get the the upper hand in comparing it to the Dark Knight is both movies are way more similar than I think I realized when I went into it. This movie is very similar to the Dark Knight. The Dark Knight takes a, a left turn and this one takes a right turn. And they both have they're both movies about Batman's effect on Gotham. And one effect on Gotham is people want to be Batman and heroic, but they wear hockey pads. And in this one, it's creating, it's, it's, it's not, this one is having a, a different effect, not the effect that Batman wants. It's turning Gotham against itself because he is vengeance. He is scary. So it, it's making people feel free to bring that out, which is, I won't say what it is, but it's very similar to uh, recent current events. And I, this was not even going through my head when I watched it, but I'm like, this is what happens. So you give people an out and they will take it. They're going to use it. You give them a path, they'll go down that path. And the Dark Knight kind of uses it in one direction and, and the Batman takes it in the other direction. And by the end of the Dark Knight, he has to be, you know, the the victim, basically, the one to take all the fault and the blame of, of Two-Face because you can't let Harvey Dent, Harvey Dent's the White Knight. Whereas in this one, it ends up with him realizing that vengeance isn't what Batman is about. Hope is what Batman is about. And, and yeah, and I just thought that that was, I was like, that is perfect. And maybe how they got there, you know, some people are arguing, whatever. But I think it, that extra Joker scene, which I called, if that would have been in there, that might have even helped it a little bit more. Or more might have been too much because we do get it later on. That's why Matt Reeves said they cut that scene. So... I, look, they're great movies. The Batman does something that the Dark Knight and the tri- Dark Knight trilogy kind of did, and that was create the rogue gallery of villains. I think this movie did it better than the Dark Knight in that aspect. I think the Dark Knight had Scarecrow, which I love. I love that he showed up and he did his little thing. But then you have the Joker and everything around it. This one, you utilize the Penguin, you utilize Falcone, you utilize Catwoman, you utilize that onion face drug dealer guy who robbed the grocery store, who is now my favorite. That's my favorite costume. Yeah. You had, you had, uh, you had two faces goons running the nightclub, the twins running the nightclub. The, and it's just, it utilized all of that, but it, it didn't connect them. Like in the dark Knight rises, they connect scarecrow. And I love that scene. Don't get me wrong, but they connect. But this one was like, the, there's a plot and they utilize the characters in Batman for the plot. They didn't have to make up new characters to fit into their narrative. They use the ones that we know to fit into the narrative. And I think that is where I give the Batman the edge. Again, they're both probably nine and a half out of 10 for me. Um, Like, you know, so I don't think it's worth arguing, but I did. That's my uh, current state of thinking as it goes on again, 14 years from now, when I've had 14 years to think about, to watch this movie and think about this movie. But I will say as much as I like the dark Knight, I watched Batman 89 and Batman and Robin more. It's, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> I, look, I, I, only, I know Batman forever is my, uh, Bat- Mask of the Phantasm is the best, 
but I, <laughs> I, I actually, I guess I watch all the Batman movies quite a bit, but the, I, the dark Knight and the Batman are very similar. And the other thing, um, which is so completely personal to me is I love the voiceover film noir. I just, I loved, I preferred that take person. That's just a personal uh, opinion. I, I preferred that take to it than the heat of Dark Knight. And that's just a personal thing. And again, they're both 9.5. You know what? The, the Batman is 9.6. Ba- Dark Knight is 9.5, just so that I have to pick one over the other. But Andrew, <laughs> why don't why don't you uh, give your opinion? You can't talk about Rises. This is just Dark Knight and the Batman. I know you're a big Rises guy, so your turn. Go for it. Yeah, this is a good question, Bridget. And uh, it is something that I think people are going to be you know, you won't be able to escape this question for like the next year, Uh, probably even until the Batman 2 comes out. But yeah, I'm in the minority. I actually prefer Rises to The Dark Knight. Um, I don't think The Dark Knight is bad. I just like Rises even more. But I think right now where my heart is taking me, and it's completely close, like these are the margin between them. You can't stick a mail file through. It would be Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises, the Batman. Um, And that's just, that's recency bias for sure. That's Riddler bias for sure. But it's just coming from a place where I feel like the Batman has the best of both worlds in what I like to see uh, in terms of a Batman story. Because the Dark Knight trilogy, as awesome as it is, it really is, like you said, James, it's heat with Batman characters in it. You know, it's it's a, a Chicago mafia movie that just has, you know, Bane pops up every once in a while. This movie, this new one, it feels, Gotham feels the way I've always wanted it to feel, which is it's this heightened world that's otherworldly. And it's not quite earth. I can't walk out my door and go to Gotham. The Gotham and the Nolan movies, I feel like I could you know, drive somewhere and I could be in that Gotham city. This one, I can't feel that. And it takes me back to that feeling of seeing Tim Burton's Gotham and Schumacher's Gotham and how much that blew me away. And the the Gotham from the, the Arkham games too. And how it's just like, there is no real city that looks like this. And I love that because everything is just slightly bigger than life and bigger than it normally would be. And roads go on a little longer and bridges arch a little more and statues are a little bit taller. And this had that on top of the whole gritty realism thing. So it melded the two worlds into something that I think is just the perfect chocolate peanut butter Batman recipe. And I was, I'm actually not a fan of the, um, the, the voiceover detective stuff, but I was in this one. And I, I'm usually not a fan because most of the time, especially when it comes to comic book stuff, it's that Frank Miller narration. And I don't care for Frank Miller. I think he's always trying too hard to be badass. Uh, it's like he's a 14-year-old boy stuck in an old man's body. And he's like, what's the most badass thing I can say in this voiceover voice? And as soon as this movie started and Batman was doing the voiceover, I was like, oh, no, what am I in for? But the voiceover here ended up being great. It didn't bother me at all. It felt classy. Uh, Frank Miller never feels classy to me. So it took that class, it added all the things that I love, it mixed Batman with realism and with fantasy in all the right ways. So I think with that mixture, if we're excluding Riddler, because I'm always going to prefer Riddler, that is what elevates this to me above The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises, is it's just got all those things firing on all those cylinders. I love it. I yeah, and to your point on that, Gotham was a huge character in this. It was a character. The ba- Batman Begins, it felt like it was going to be a character, and then by the time we got to Dark Knight, it's like not nah, Chicago. And this one had a lot of Chicago in it, but it wasn't Chicago. It was like you never quite knew where you were, but you always knew you were in Gotham City. The other thing with this one, and I touched this on our spoiler review a little bit, was it really felt like it was connected to the adam west batman now not in tone or style 
but you had a phone, like the freaking bat phone. It wasn't red, sure, but it was like an old fashioned dial, like phone. Yes. It had, it didn't have Aunt Harriet in it, but it had Dory. Like, the, and there were like little things that I'm like, this feels like this Batman that I knew. Like, it was taking me back, but it was also I'm 40. Like, it was, so it was kind of <laughs> like, like, it was like, here's what you liked when you were a kid. Here's the adult version of what you liked as a kid. That's kind of what it was taking me as too with this one. And I really appreciated all those little touches to it. And, I, and, I said this again, it's like, they're both grounded in this reality, but I feel like this one's a little bit more of a fantastical reality. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm I'm really curious where they take things. I don't think it's going to ever go over the top. And I don't think we're ever going to see a Superman. And again, like I said, off the top of the show, the Batman universe is as deep as the DC and Marvel universe is at, on its own. It doesn't need to have Superman. It, it, like, just let these characters be and breathe and bring them all in. And I, I really appreciate that. That being said, if they ever made the Bat Flag movie and he fought off and like that stuff happened, I'm all in on that too. Like, just don't get me wrong. But yeah. in this world, like Batman is just like enough for me and the Batman villains are enough. And I think when you have the two-faced goons, whether that's, a, you know, that might be just a little Easter egg, the twins, that might be your Easter egg. But it also opens a door to, well, Gil Coulson was a DA. He's gone. They need a new DA. Who are they going to bring in? You're going to bring in this, you know. And Cast Billy D. That would be amazing. But, you know, like they, they, like you have these little breadcrumbs spread out. There's opportunity. Obviously, the unseen Arkham Prisoner. Also, the, the, the thing that that scene does, and the deleted scene might have done even more, is this is year two. So this is already the dark night of this franchise, basically. But this is year two now. And the brilliant thing of that is there's a whole year one where he captured criminals and put them in Arkham and put them every, all these other places. And I think that's, that's genius to me that these characters exist already. And now that you have the Joker, Matt Reeves said, we might not even get the Joker again. That might be the only time we see him, but he wanted him to be there because he wanted you to know. And this is the brilliance of that scene is because the Joker's there. That means anybody else could be there. Mm -hmm. Any other Batman villain could be there or could be out there. Nobody needs to turn into anybody. They could already be established and show up. And I love that aspect of this. And uh, again, though, I love the I love the Dark Knight. I just watched it a week ago, and I was just like, "Damn, this is a, a beautiful, beautiful movie." Uh, and th- this movie, though, the final thought for me, Andrew, on this one, then I'll let you take it. This movie for me is very similar to the Joker in that they just kind of made a movie, and uh, they wanted to make this movie, and here's the movie they make, and they base it off of the, the old '70s and '80s stuff, and they did what they wanted, and here you go, take it or leave it. That's that was honestly that was my biggest takeaway. Was I'm like, this is more like the Joker. Than like the Dark Knight, even though those two will always get compared. Yeah, I want to. Um, I, I can't remember what Todd Phillips, like, if he had a reason specifically for setting the Joker in an '80s Gotham. Um, I, I I don't know if that was a nod to a specific comic or what his reasoning was behind making it a period piece without really being a period piece. I think um, it was just to make it the the uh, king of comedy, the <laughs> De Niro movie. I think that's yeah. all he wanted to do. He just literally just wanted to make that movie. He was just like, yeah, let me just uh, slap a no, uh, clown coat of paint on king of comedy. That, that, I'm really curious why that got, but I, that's that's a question for another day. But yeah, this Gotham, the Batman's Gotham, is right where I want it to be, and I want them to go even further with it. Like I feel like, um, is it? Is it Max Shrek's company where his logo is just that big smiling head? Is that what? Yeah, I feel like yeah. that head would not feel out of place in this Gotham. No, no that's what I love. And you've played the Arkham games, like you know, you stand on a rooftop, you see a sea of roofs and water towers and radio towers, and like way more neon than any real world city would have, and mm-hmm. all the colors of the rainbow. I'm like, that's Gotham for me. So get that going. Get us more of that. And I'm I'm never leaving the theater. I'll just keep watching them on repeat. And you know, I hate long movies. I'm not into long movies, but this one I was I sent a text to, to my wife when I ended in the theater and I said, We're gonna stick around for the next showing. And I totally <laughs> would have too. I like I was like, I love that movie. Um, it was really good. Let's move on now, Andrew. We're going to talk about what should have been the first topic of the day, but I screwed up. So we're going to talk about Robert Pattinson as Batman. We're going to keep the flame, the wings going. Robert Pattinson, Batman. 
let's just rank our Batman, Andrew. Let's rank them all. We will, we're going to leave Adam West out of the discussion. Adam West mm-hmm. is the quintessential Batman. He's number one in all of our lists, but it's not fair to put him in this list because I don't think he would rank. But where where would you put Robert Pattinson in your list of all time favorite Batman? Well, for live all, a, live action. Let's go live live action. action yeah. Um, I don't know if you were thinking the same thing at the theater, but. Pattinson's mask, there's something uh, like a ridge over his eyes that looks like eyebrows. So his mask reminded same, yes. me a lot of Adam West. Yeah. Yeah. No, but well, that's the thing. This movie had a lot of nods to the 60s show. Like, <laughs> not like in your face, but like little, little bits, little details that they took. And like I said, they made, they're like, if you're 10, then this is how that would be when you're 50, 40, like that. That's how I felt. Well, mm-hmm. not, but I did notice that, that that hit me in the theater as well. Oh boy. All right. Where does Robert Pattinson fall? <sighs> I, I'm going to say, I'll let you think about it. And I'll give my, my thing right now. I'm going to go Clooney on the bottom of the barrel. Unfortunately, I think, I do think he is actually Bruce Wayne though, to be yes. honest. Um, now this is the problem. If we're going with just Batman, my list might change because I really like Val Kilmer's Batman. I'm a huge Val Kilmer Batman fan, not a massive Val Kilmer Bruce Wayne fan, but Val Val Kilmer Batman. I really like, I'm going to go Clooney and then above Clooney will be Bale. Yeah, that's right. I'm not really his raspy voice. Sometimes I can take it. Sometimes I'm just not in the mood for on top of that. I'm going to go, uh, Kilmer. Keaton, Pattinson, Batfleck. That's a good ranking. I like Here's that. The th- this is the thing, though, is we've had one movie with Pattinson and I've had one screening. And his Batman act is really fantastic. He's like a fantastic Batman to me. His Bruce Wayne is what's going to divide a lot of people, I think. And it's mm-hmm. and it's not his performance as Bruce Wayne. It's the character that he's portraying as Bruce Wayne. Whereas, like, for me, Val Kilmer, I didn't think he portrayed Bruce Wayne like his performance as Bruce Wayne wasn't top notch for me. Whereas Pattinson, his performance was amazing as Bruce Wayne, but was the character of the Bruce Wayne that I wanted. But, but he's my number two Batman right now. I just think he's, he's phenomenal. And while you're still thinking, Andrew, they have been doing polls all across the United States of America for your favorite Batman. And Ben Affleck has actually been edging out Michael Keaton on most of those polls as their favorite Batman. Nice. Um, well, I think so. I thought he was a great Batman. I know people are like, he didn't get a solo movie. He deserves it. He got, he, he was in two mo- two movies, or, well, I guess Suicide Squad. He was, he got a fair shake as Batman in, in Batman v Superman. And I really liked what I got there. And I'm one of the few people that love that movie. So that's my ranking. Also, everybody watching, let us know your ranking. Because now, Andrew, I've had it. You've had enough time to think about it. Give me your Batfleck rankings. Okay, Batfleck. my Batfleck rankings. Batfleck, Batfleck, Batfleck. <laughs> uh, wow, okay. So I'm going Clooney on the bottom two. Uh, movie is fun, but he's just, he's not a bad man for me. Um, next, I'm going Kilmer. <laughs> that, that movie's fun. Uh, yeah, I'm going Kilmer next, only because I've only seen Batman Forever one time. Uh, so, and every time I think of that movie, all I can think of is, Jim Carrey as the Riddler. Like, I can't even picture what Kilmer's bat suit looks like. It's completely blank for me. Um, if I remember right, I think it's the logo is all black with the circle around it. It's basically the yellow Keaton yeah. symbol, but all black. Yeah, right? they, that's when they started to get rid of color off the bat suits. Yeah. Um, so Kilmer Batman, I I can't, I couldn't quote one line of his. Like, he's completely off my chart. Tell me, um, do you like the circus? Is that what he says? He says that he to says Chase that, Meridian? Yeah, but he says it as Bruce Wayne. Anyway, go on. Okay. Um, next, Bale. Um, he was a near-perfect Bruce Wayne. Mm-hmm. I think he looks like Bruce Wayne, like yeah. the, as if the like the 90s cartoon came to life. That's, that's Christian Bale. Yes. Um, but his Batman was A, not on screen a lot, and those are not short movies. Uh, they're yeah. like... So he does not get a whole lot of time in there. And, you know, when he's on screen, it's kind of silly. Oh, he sounds. So <laughs> he's he's not quite there for me. Now this is the tricky part. This is the tricky part because I yeah, think. This, this, this is hard because it's, you yeah. know, you've had one that's been your Batman since you were two years old. I know. 
Then there's another one who kind of came in last minute and kind of did a great job, but didn't really get the recognition of the part they needed. And then you got one that you've just watched right? mm-hmm. <laughs> like once it's, it's tricky. I think I'm going just based off of the, the arcs that they have and the personalities they bring to the table and everything. I think I'm going to go in this case and it's close. It's very close again. <sighs> Affleck, Keaton, Patterson, but it's like I, I feel like a I, like a slight breeze could change that. You know what I mean? It's it. Uh, Pattinson's Batman is closer to Keaton's Batman. Mm-hmm. Affleck's Batman is a completely different, like on a completely different level. Like there's so I'm kind of glad that this is the Batman that we got after the Ben Affleck Batman because it's so different from the Ben Affleck Batman. Yeah, like Ben Affleck's Batman is superhero Batman. This one's Detective Batman, and Keaton's isn't really Detective, but he's 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 more similar to this one than this than they are to the Ben Affleck one. So it's it's. Would you watch a Ben Affleck solo Batman? Oh, hundred percent. Uh, yeah, of course. I and I think we have to also take into account something Pattinson did really well is that the Nolan trilogy is supposed, especially, you know, the first one, Batman Begins, it's right there in the title, is about the Bruce Wayne becoming Batman story. But he felt like the same guy with the same knowledge in part one that he did in part three. Whereas with Pattinson, I really feel way more that this is a young Batman who is still starting out and doesn't quite he's not quite as sure of himself and is not quite as confident as we know Batman eventually will be. Right. Like I feel like in Batman begins, he has the same level of of confidence and skill that he has in the dark Knight rises, except now he can climb out of a well at the end. Um, The Pattinson though, feels like there's a lot more room to grow. So that makes his Batman more interesting to me. It's just funny how, you know, Batman begins was like touted as like, he's young Batman. He's starting out. He's fresh. He's new. This feels more fresh and young and new and an experience than that one did. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, he's yeah, he's really trying to figure out, which is why I think it's great that the Joker's already in prison mm-hmm. or in Arkham, because the Joker would be the bad guy that you I mean the Dark Knight the Dark Knight version aside, the Joker's like like you say he's like, I have a bomb, come and get me. Like that's the and this version of the Joker, according to Reeves, isn't quite the Joker yet. So he doesn't he hasn't even figured it out yet himself, but he's just like, I'm crazy and people I'm hideous and stuff like that. So he's kind of doing it. I think that's the perfect reason why he could already be put aside and Batman would have got him already. That's like low tier villainy right there. And the Riddler's like top tier. And he's like, I'm going to up your ante, but his smarts get to him. And, and that's what it, it's, it's great. It's great to see the arcs of the, the Batman that we've got. And Keaton's didn't have too much of an arc though. They weren't really concerned with, with that. I find the um, Batman movies until like now, they haven't really cared about Batman. Mm-hmm. Like Batman has just kind of been like secondary to Bruce, like you said, to Bruce Wayne, especially the Nolan ones, right? Like, it, like even, and we talked about this on the spoiler, I think the spoiler or the non-spoiler review, which I can't remember which one, but we talked about how when Ben Affleck was cast as Batman, they asked Matt Damon and Matt Damon said, well, the acting is Bruce Wayne. You don't have to act as Batman. And Robert Pattinson acted the hell out of Batman. He was a bad... Ba- he, you know what? I'm going to change my list because his acting was phenomenal. His eye acting that he did yes. was like, that was the best. Like he didn't say anything. He just like, look and, and you're like, Oh, I see what's going on here. And he just, he had this, like his walk was like, he walked so upright and like he took his steps carefully and like you, it almost felt like he knew he was in over his head, but he also knew how to get out of it. That's how I kind of felt the whole time watching him. Um, and, and I love that this movie made Batman the lead. Like they thank, yes. thank you for making Batman the lead. And his character had a character arc. His character, like, and I and I do think Ben Affleck's uh Batman had a character arc, but, but it's it's such in like all the other characters that it's kind of like it's not the main focus. But his character obviously through Batman v Superman, he learns to become the hero once again. And this one is the story about him first be like we said earlier, like the vengeance, and now it's it's the the symbol of hope and just great stuff. And in the comics too, we, we can't forget, and even in the cartoons, Batman is written differently when he's a part of the Justice League. 
as opposed yeah. to when it's a Batman story. Uh, there's just something different about the way he acts. He's around these other people. Uh, he he gets quieter. Like it, it's it's almost like two different characters in a way uh, compared to just a bare bones Batman story. So that's what Batfleck gave us. He gave us that version of Batman, the version who's playing on this team. He's just one of the Beatles. He's got to sing in harmony with everybody else. Uh, so it's to compare him. It's you almost have to put an asterisk next to him because of that. Yeah, absolutely. And George Clooney had a bad credit card. So once again, he is actually the best Batman because he had a credit score. He's the richest Bruce Wayne. He is. <laughs> there you go. Let's move on to a Moon Knight. The show Moon Knight, Andrew, is coming on March 30th. You are going to be doing Infinity Rewatch right here on the channel with Ryan J. Whitehead. Uh, I think the Thursdays, as I always said, the Thursdays after after the show uh, plays, you'll be on here talking about that show, rewatching it, living it all over again. And you guys love your MCU over there. Love talking about it. Ryan is a huge Moon Knight fan. Can't wait for this show. It's going to be TV 14. So it's going to be Kevin Feige says they're not holding anything back. They're not holding their punches. We'll see how that's going to go. But recently the showrunner, Andrew, has said that he could, he believes that the purpose of this show is to drive Moon Knight towards the Avengers to become part of the Avengers. Hmm. I was reading that and I said, yeah, maybe. I like the Midnight Suns idea of it. I think the way that MCU is going, it's going in the supernatural horror direction i'm kind of really intrigued by that we talked about michael Chikino doing werewolf by night he's directing that and that's coming and blades coming and punisher's gonna come on punisher's coming in we know all that <laughs> stuff's coming uh it's getting fantastical but how do you feel about moon knight being part of the avengers uh see that's a tricky thing to say because i don't know as much about moon knight as my co-host ryan does he is a moon knight fan to the extreme you know he could tell you a lot about him um <laughs> But based on what I know about Moon Knight, I know he's got either disassociative identity disorder or multiple identity disorder. I can't remember which. Uh, so there's at least four guys rattling around in that brain, uh, which would make it interesting to see him play on a team, right? Uh, if he's solo, it could be this fun kind of noir story with this detective who's got four different minds rattling around in his own brain and how all four of them kind of have to team up to solve whatever is going on. But if you stick them in a room with Scarlet Witch and War Machine and what have you, then it becomes, all right, how does this guy play with others? Is he friendly? I don't know if he's a friendly character. I don't know if he's a jerk. I really have nothing going into the show except he's got a cool costume. I don't even know who his villains are. So I want to see a character on this show that along the same lines of what we were just talking about with Batfleck, I want to see a character, this would just be the most interesting for me, where he is, he, he works better alone, even though technically he's not alone because he's got all these personalities, but throwing him into a team makes him awkward uh, and maybe even shy. Because I don't think, we, have we seen that yet? Is there an Avenger who's like, I'm not comfortable around people? I don't think we have that. So I think if it's something different, at least, I'd like to see that. So if we are going to get him as an Avenger, throw in a character dynamic that we haven't seen yet. And in terms of the Midnight Suns, we have enough characters now. To, I mean, depending on what happens with this X-Men shenanigans, <laughs> we're going to have more than enough characters. But we have so many characters now in this franchise that having more than one team isn't outside the realm of possibility anymore. And that could make for some interesting stories down the road. You know, Avengers versus Midnight Suns, Avengers versus West Coast Avengers. I don't know, what are they going to do? Uh, but you could really play with that in a bigger way than than, than Civil War did. Uh, Civil War just kind of took one team and split it down the middle. With this, you could really have, uh, you know, I'm thinking Lost World Jurassic Park. You got one team going on the island. You got a whole other team going on the island. They both kind of want the same thing, but maybe they don't all get along. And somebody is Pete Postlethwaite. So that's always going to throw a wrench in the equation. So get Moon Knight on a team. Get him awkward. Let's see him uh, have some awkward uh, interactions with his teammates and make him be a shy guy. That's what I want to see. And then 
maybe have some uh, other teams in there for good measure. Because James, Midnight Suns, I think I speak for everybody when I say that's something we all kind of want to see happen too, right? I think it'd be cool. I think that's, you know, like Netflix did their Defenders, and I think that's something Disney Plus can maybe – uh, yeah. work towards right with midnight and then because where werewolf by night that's also going to be disney plus so if these characters are living on disney plus aside from blade obviously why not just put that on disney plus make that something happening there whether it's a film or or not i don't know i liked what kevin feige said and then he backpedal where he said the event they were going to make any more avengers films i was like yes that's good because i mean it's great like it's name brand and everything that's name recognition and brand and all that that's fine but at the same time, like we've gotten the four four Avengers movies, the Avengers have kind of disbanded. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like Stark is dead. Captain America's kind of, you know, he can't be him anymore. Like, they're kind of like disbanded. That's not to say we can't have other teams. You know, like mm -hmm. bring another team. So they don't have to, all have to be the Avengers. We can go back to the Avengers whenever you want. That's a well that you can tap into whenever. But I was fine. Like when he said that, I'm like, that's cool. Like, let's move on. Let's do something else. Like, they don't always have to be the Avengers. Here's the Avengers team up. It doesn't, doesn't need to be like that. It could be whatever you want. I know that I think the young Avengers might be something they're playing with, but you know, it doesn't need to be the Avengers. It could be Midnight Suns. It could be all, they could have multiple teams. Could you imagine the MCU what, like has multiple team big event films now? So you're like, I'm gonna go watch this movie and this movie and this movie, and those ones go over here, and these ones go over here, and there's all these big ones, and then Andrew, they can have their big crisis infinity war event again. And then all those teams have to come together. And then that's your Avengers movie now, right? That's the new Avengers. Here we go. That was something that I really liked the Feige said. Then he backtracked. So well, that's not really what I meant. I'm like, ah, let's do it. Come on. <laughs> like, cause think about it. If you, if you deprive of us of, of Avengers, Andrew, and then all of a sudden this event leads up and they're like, guess what? The Avengers got to get back together. Then it's like, oh, there we go. You know, if you have an Avengers movie every year, it's like that's gonna take away from, from, from the from the brand a little bit. Like, I, you know, I don't need that every day. You're giving me yeah. all this other stuff. Do it. Not every year. Not every, like granted, I am of the mind where like, and this is just me being greedy. But when all is said and done, like, give me have there be ten Avengers movies, right? Like, I'm happy with that. But I like what you're saying. Like multiple teams, and it's like, oh, this year there's the the big movie with like six spider-men and four doctor stranges then that like you know all these teams doing whatever uh and then they all come together for a giant eight and a half hour film uh that, <laughs> <laughs> that never like, that gets delayed because covid 23 is yeah. uh, closing down theaters but, but doesn't infinity war work so much better because it, it's the big event like it's, it's big, it's catastrophic. Do you know what? And it's yes, taking it, it's, every character we've had, right? Yeah, it's the end of that saga. And see, I'm really, I'm so curious of, you know, obviously Kevin Feige has, he, he knows more in advance than he tells us, obviously. But what I've always been really curious about, especially after Endgame, is does Kevin Feige have a movie in mind for like, I don't know, 2038, where he's like, this is the end of the MCU. This is, this is the, this is it. This, there's no more after this. Uh, and like, if so, how is he building towards it? Uh, and if not, where, what's he planning on doing? Uh, like, I, I'm so curious what that looks like. I'm wondering if they're just, playing this maybe phase by phase they're like this phase is this but the within the phases there are many phases really the points that they have to hit because I, I don't i don't think you ever plan an ending to this because this is also your movie studio <laughs> so you'd have to relaunch i guess and i think the 2038 is good because you have to be far enough removed from robert downey jr and Chris Evans and Benedict Cumberbatch to be able to reboot these characters with new actors. Cause that's inevitably that's going to happen. It's going to happen. I know everyone's like, I can only be one Iron Man. Well, no, there was because he ended up sliding in right at the right time. Right. When they created this MCU, if they made Iron Man in the nineties, there'd be multiple Iron Man actors running around like Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't worry about it. But I, I eventually they're going to redo them all because they're going to want to keep making movies, but we are in a weird time where we've never had to face this before. Like, you know, right. movies aren't that old, but they haven't had, they didn't do the MCU in 1920s. They're doing it in 2020s. So we haven't had this opportunity to see where they go forward. But I think, I think they're going to want to re 
they're going to remake them. We'll be old. Like, we'll be a lot older and we'll be like, whatever. Uh, oh, they're making another one of the Iron Man movies? That's how we're <laughs> going to be. Uh, I don't think I, I think they have enough characters, though, that they can work through through some time. But I don't I don't see Feige having an endgame to the MCU. Good. Interesting point, though. Okay. Alien. Are you a big Alien franchise guy? Mm-hmm. I love Alien. There's a new uh, TV series on Hulu apparently rumored to be coming out from the director of uh, Fargo. Fargo showrunner is apparently creating that. But there's also, Andrew, a new movie in the works to be coming to Hulu. We're going to talk about this movie from the director of The Evil Dead. Apparently, this is what I like about this. This is what I really like about this, Andrew, why I'm excited for this Hulu movie. First of all, there's a Predators movie coming out on Disney+, Plus, which also might be Hulu. That I'm excited for it too. That's from the director of 10 Cloverfield Lane, which I'm a huge fan of. Love that yeah. movie. Yeah. Can't wait for that. So I really believe in that. That one sounds, if you don't know what that one's about, we're going to talk about it on the channel eventually because I'm really excited for that movie. But this alien movie has me also excited because the idea is that the the director of Evil Dead, I believe his last name is Al- Alvarez. I haven't seen the new Fetty Evil Fetty Alvarez. Yet. Yeah, Fetty Alvarez. There you go. He pitched this like casually to to um, Ridley Scott years ago. He pitched this movie idea to Ridley Scott for Alien years ago. And Ridley Scott says it was just something that he couldn't stop thinking about after all this time. And now he's like, let's just do it. And Hulu seems perfect. The budget's going to be low, so it's going to take them more back to their roots. All this is really exciting to me because I think the Terminator franchise needs to do that because I saw Terminator Dark Fate and I said, what are you doing? You need (laughs) to stop it. Like that movie could have been something and instead it's like, this is what people like. We'll just do what they did the first time but have it make no sense. You're like, well, it made sense the first time. I like that you strip them down, you make them tell a story, and it seems like he's passionate about it, and it's an idea that Ridley Scott could not get out of his head. And I love that idea because, you know, Creed, the movie Creed was kind of similar as well, where where Coogler was like, he had this idea, and he wanted to do it, and Stallone was like, hey, you know, we got enough of the movie. And Coogler was like, no, we got to do it. And he was very passionate about it. And I think and we talked about the Batman a little bit and the Joker, and these are movies that are passionate. These are filmmakers who are passionate about the material that they're making and if you're passionate about it don't just let the studio be like we're making a new alien movie let the filmmaker say hey this is what i love let's do it yes and anything i mean ridley scott seems just like the most grouchy crusty old curmudgeon <laughs> on the planet so if something is going to get him excited then it's something that i want to see uh, like what can get that man's pulse to quicken it must be something interesting it must be something cool but these news stories about this movie, about this project, they confuse the hell out of me, James, because they specifically say an Alien 5 movie, but then they go on to say it's not set in the continuity of the other Alien movies and it's completely yeah. removed. So that's fine, but just don't call it an Alien 5 movie. Just say another movie set in, you know, an, an Alien reboot or something. I don't know. I'll uh, probably but- just call it Alien. <laughs> probably at this point yeah uh, but it's just every article i find is calling it alien five and i feel like what are you doing you're you're contradicting yourself um it's so it's going to be smaller it's going to be lower budget it's going to be a very personal story that's all exciting the first alien was small it was low budget it was a personal story um and as of right now the alien franchise's timeline which i am a big fan of i think they've done a good job of it but it's sort of in a spot where I, it doesn't feel like they themselves are interested in continuing. You know what I mean? Like Covenant, it, it feels like Covenant ended on this, not even a cliffhanger, but it ended on this big note of like, things are going to get worse before they get better. But it feels like Fox and Ridley Scott and whoever have no intention of mm-hmm. showing us that, you know, like, yeah, David has all those uh, embryos now, whatever, the end. Like, it doesn't feel like they care enough to make a sequel to Covenant. So if they're going to make another movie, I would rather they make something they do care about. So sure, give us this other one. I've never not had fun in an Alien movie except AVP 2 Requiem because... (laughs) Because. uh, I just watched that uh, like a year ago. Last summer, I watched Aaron and I watched all of the uh, Alien movies. We were just like, because she loves them. And I was like, oh, let's watch them all. So we watched them all. And uh, we got to that one. How many not... times did you have to adjust the brightness on your TV? <laughs> Never. I have a good TV. 
it was it was intriguing though because it took place right after like they were like right in i was like i was like this movie's gonna be bad but it should be good and i watched it i didn't i didn't think it was as bad no what it wasn't as bad as i (laughs) it wasn't as bad as i anticipated we'll leave it at that it was (laughs) I think I was expecting something because of what I had heard. I never saw that one before. I saw the first one in the theater and I saw it another one or two times after that. But uh, yeah, I, Alien's fun. I, but I, I just, I really believe it. I really think they have something going on here and I think they're excited about it. And uh, I'm excited to see what comes from from Alien. That's it, really. Moving on, Andrew. Let's One more topic to go and then I'll let you get out of here. Batman was released Batman. this weekend. It uh, did huge numbers at the box office. Second biggest opening during the pandemic. Spider-Man No Way Home, the only one bigger. Two things that come to my mind with those is, obviously these are two of the most iconic characters characters of all time. And uh, Spider-Man No Way Home also had the multiverse angle, which everybody was very excited about. And they, and they pulled it off perfectly. That made you want to go back and watch it multiple times. Batman, we'll see how many times people want to go back to see Batman. Uh, but in the uh, domestic box office, Andrew, it made $128 million, And in the worldwide, it made $248.5 million. Uh, big numbers, good numbers. Not crazy, but for the pandemic era, very, very good numbers, obviously. Mm-hmm. 248 audience, opening weekend in a pandemic? Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, worldwide. yeah that's very good. Uh, we'll see how time goes, how it goes. I don't have the... Um, numbers in front of me here i thought i did but i lost them but the joker i believe made 40 million opening weekend around there 30 to 40 opening weekend i don't have a thing i'll have to look it up but that movie went on to make a billion dollars and that one even though this isn't rated r let's just it's basically rated r you're not gonna take your kids to go see this batman movie we talked a bit a bit about it on our spoiler review there was a kid in the theater with us not with us but in the row in front of us and i don't think they enjoyed the movie at all people take um, their kids to everything and it just it really baffles me i was i had to be sitting next to an like a nine-year-old girl that somebody brought with them to see kingsman 2 um and it was not comfortable for either of us so oh, i don't yeah. i don't understand some parents uh, yeah, but do me so- do me a favor james before you go on here do me a favor everybody who says Three hour long movies can't make enough money. Re- say, tell, tell the world again how much money Batman made. I want that. Uh, 248.5. I want to say the Joker made 93.5 opening weekend. It was 33 on its pre- pre- preview showings. I got that mixed up. So it was uh, 93.5 opening weekend for the Joker. So this did more. That's domestic. So this did more than the Joker. It made 234 worldwide, the Joker. So 10 million less worldwide. And about thirty million less in, uh, in, uh, domestically. So, Joker went on to make a billion. Do you think Batman has a chance to make a billion? Do you think that this movie is hitting fans the way it needs to be? They, that the way they wanted to hit. Because conversely, Andrew Fantasia, Batman v Superman made more opening weekend. You've got to think that the that any other iteration of this character would have made a lot of money as well. So second to this question is, do you think it was the right choice to replace Ben Affleck as Batman, even though he wanted to leave? And that's not really an argument, but we have to talk about it. Yeah, it was the right choice for this, because this is a different story. It's a different Batman. Um, Ben's Bruce would not have fit with this story. It would have had to be an entirely different movie. So, yeah, and and DC is all about the multiverse. Let them have their multiverses. Let them have multiple Batman and Flashes and whatnot. Uh, I think that cracking a billion is is totally feasible for the batman it's literally only been out for a few days it has made a bunch of money and the word of mouth is good the batman v superman thing i mean yes that's going to make a ton of money opening weekend because it's batman v superman it's a big dc crossover that we had never seen before and plus Wonder Woman was in it, which they still should not have spoiled. But the thing is, the theatrical cut of that movie was such a mess that eventually everybody was like, yeah, don't bother going to see Batman maybe Superman. But then eventually they cleaned it up with that nice uh, director's cut. But you have this on the other hand, you have the Pattinson bat. And I mean, look at the, look what we did at the top of this video. It, it's been out for what, four days. And already the world is asking 
is this as good as The Dark Knight, the comic book movie that the world has not shut up about for the past 15 years? People are suddenly asking, did this beat that movie? So the fact that that conversation is being had tells me, I can't remember how much money Dark Knight made overall, but I know it wasn't paltry. So it tells me that this is well on its way to hitting a billion dollar mark and well on its way to being like heralded as one of the greats. Right? How much did Dark Knight make? Like it uh, ended up, I guess over time it made it made one point one point zero zero five billion US. Hey, there we go. Um was it Dark Knight a flop? Is <laughs> yeah. Okay, I don't think, rate. but I think that's over time, though. I think it's over time with over one. It, so it's made over a billion. Um, again, I love this Batman movie. I can't wait to watch it again. The problem with this Batman movie making money, like that kind of money, though, Andrew, is on April nineteenth. It's on HBO Max. Right. We, I, I, so in Canada, where we are, we're not going to get it. We're not going to get to stream it right away. But in the states, they're going to get. In other places that have HBO Max, they're going to get it April nineteenth. And and I know your argument is long movies don't like they make money and they do. And I think you're correct on that argument, but do long movies make money when they're also available to stream in the theater? Because if you have a choice to watch a three hour movie in the theater or a three hour movie at home, I think you're more inclined to watch it at home. And I think this 40 day, 40 day window, you know, it's better than last year's debacle where they same day release it, HBO max and in the theater, but it's still only 45 days. And, and, you know, you talk about Spider-Man, which is the only movie that's made more than this. It's been out for December, January, February, March. It's been out for four months and it's still not available until the end of this month, the 22nd, mm-hmm. I believe. Like it's not available to stream. And that's not even streaming, that's buying. This is streaming. You don't even have to spend a dime on it if you already have HBO Max. You're just gonna get it. Like, so I, that that's the what that's gonna be a hurdle for it. It's gonna have to make a lot of money. And look, pre-pandemic, I think it would have been fine because it, these movies did better opening weekends they didn't have longevity but now we're back to the old days the 20 years ago where movies had longevity where titanic was in the theater for five months we're into that now like spider-man no way home would not be out still pre-pandemic like it would be you know it would be gone it would it would have made the same amount of money but it would have been done earlier that's what i'm saying but now you i don't know you're stretching it you've only got a month and a half to make to make money and it's really good i hope it continues to snowball and make more and more and more as time goes on but also people have seen it there's going to be people who love the dark noir tone of it and there's going to be people who are turned off by it and those people might not ever watch it again and they might be like well i'll watch it again but i'll wait for streaming i guess they they don't have to wait long yeah that's i forgot all about that and that's a wild card that changes everything i don't know why they're doing that so soon um i mean things are opening now it is, you know, you could keep that movie in there for another month and you will be fine. Are they going to, what's the date you said? April 14th? 19th, I believe. April 19th. Is the plan that on the 19th you can stream it for free or is it like a premier HBO access? Max. No, HBO Max. It's just on HBO Max. It's just there. You don't have to pay for it. To, okay. That's, yeah. See, that's, uh, that changes a lot now. Oh, really? I don't know. Like everybody who wants to see it and everybody who wants to see it will obviously be seeing it before then. Uh, but the thing about the Batman, and it's funny because this is kind of a, um, a rare thing these days, James, with a huge blockbuster like this. But there's nothing aside from the the character cameo at the end, which is really kind of insignificant to the plot when push comes to shove there's nothing really about this movie that's a huge spoiler is there yeah we talked about that on was it the non-spoiler or the spoiler review where i said this movie doesn't really have spoilers yeah but the whole thing it's like but when you start to know it that's the spoiler is in the details like yeah spoiling it would be the details because the movie is about the details and this is the world we live in though and i think empire strikes back screwed it for everybody but like people don't want the details they want the twists and the turns right and that you know you go into every star wars movie now it's like what's the big twist gonna be why does it have to be a big twist there doesn't have to be a big twist and this one doesn't have a big twist really i mean it kind of does but not really but like you know there's a one cameo that's in it Mm -hmm. and 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 that you know kind of leaked and and it's you know it is what it is. It's you're right. There's nothing to really spoil. 
in this movie. That it, it, I don't know. It's I hope it makes I hope this movie makes a billion dollars. And don't forget, Dark Knight made a billion dollars 14 years ago. And it wasn't yeah. in 3D. Not that this one's in 3D, but ticket prices were cheaper back then. AMC wasn't charging a dollar more at least for these for people to go see the movie <laughs> like they are today. So I don't I don't know. I hope it does well. I hope HBO Max doesn't uh, poo-poo it at all. But audiences are clearly liking it. I just went on the on everyone's favorite website. I hate it. Rotten Tomatoes. It's still not audience score is still 90%. And critics is 85. I don't think that's gonna change. But the audience score, Andrew, is 90% from over 10 thousand ratings 10 thousand ratings on 90 percent. that is a lot of people mm-hmm. liking this movie. that's a lot of people walking away from this movie saying i like it that is 10 out of a thousand not liking this movie <laughs> like you have a pretty good chance of liking it now i, I could say like i think the runtime and and because it's a slow burn that's going to turn that is going to be a deterrent for a lot of people. A lot of people don't like that. A lot of people like the quick, flashy, blah, 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 here we go. And that's not what this That's not what this movie is. It's not the flaw of the movie, but that's not what it is. And that's going to be either you like it or you don't. I don't know. I can't remember if he said so in our spoiler review, but if he's uh, on his third viewing now, Rob McDonald, has he made it? Uh, has he made it a choice whether this has beaten the Dark Knight for him or not? I, I, he hasn't told me. I haven't asked him. My guess is going to be it won't. That's my guess because Rob is the Dark Knight is like his favorite movie, so I don't see this one. I, I've noticed a lot of people who the Dark Knight is their favorite movie. This is like their next favorite, yeah. um, and that's how I think it's going to be. And I think it's fair. And I, but I think time is uh, crucial. Also, there's good look. The Dark Knight has been with us for 14 freaking years. There are people who are 14 years old who only you know that was the movie that they're born into. Like so, it's going to take time for this movie to grow on people. And look, right now we're high praising it. And you joked about it, but maybe when we watch it again and we watch it again and maybe we'll watch it again and maybe we've had a year of this movie, maybe we go, you know what? It's just not holding up the way that The Dark Knight did. Or maybe I think this movie is going to hold up, though. I do. I believe that in 20 years, this will be a Batman movie like The Dark Knight that we look back on fondly. And it's like the gold standard of 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 Batman movies, of detective movies and and what. And I kind of honestly, I hope that this brings a new genre of like detective storytelling back into cinemas. Oh, same man. Same. I hope I have so many hopes for the, like, I, I want this to be a trilogy too. I want them to make more and I want them to be the same vein, like big and long and like dark and slow boil and really just embracing the, the mystery and majesty of this otherworldly Gotham. And I want the Blu-ray releases to have a black and white option. Cause that would be so much fun. <laughs> Uh, and above all, I want them to do what no Batman movie has done yet is give the villains arcs over the course of the series. So Riddler is probably a sure bet that we're going to see him again. Yes. So give it, <laughs> get, get, you know, get some growth for the Riddler in there. Uh, because that's one of, at this point, you've had so many Batman movies, you have to start mining the veins of ore that you have not mined yet. And that is a juicy one way to be mined. So if Matt Reeves is smart, that's where he's going to go. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of options for him to to take with this, especially with the ending. When I first saw the end, I'm like, how do you come out of this? And I realized there's a lot of ways to come out of that. And there are a lot of fun ways to come out of it. And again, it has that fantastical element that he's going for, the grounded fantastical element. So I can't wait where, where he's going with this franchise. I can't wait for more. I can't wait for more Penguin. Uh, Penguin and Catwoman stood out a lot for me. I thought Penguin interrogated by Gordon and Batman is one of my favorite Batman scenes of all time. I just thought everything going on in there, Colin Farrell's performance, everything was just great. The way he's like, oh, why are you showing me that? No, I got like the whole thing. <laughs> it was just so good. Um, it was just so much fun. Uh, Catwoman was great. Catwoman, I wasn't really sure what to make of Catwoman going into this because we've gotten so many Catwomans and like they've all kind of been the same but different. But and this and then when I saw like the fight, I'm like, that looks fun. But what's she gonna bring to it? And she brought a lot to it. I thought like there was a lot of character in there, and and it wasn't just shoehorning in these characters because when they first said Catwoman was gonna be in it, I was like, oh, they're just throwing Catwoman in now, like because she's like Catwoman. You got because that's how I felt when in Dark Knight Rises. Like I like Catwoman in that movie, but it was also like, oh, they're just doing Catwoman, like because it's gotta be Catwoman. You know, mm-hmm. could have been anybody. But this one, it felt that felt like the most organic, even more than Returns uh, of Catwoman being in a plot of a movie in a lot of ways. Like they put her in wonderfully. Can't wait. I hope she moves on. I hope she has a movie with uh, Nightwing. Hey, yeah, she's in Bloodhaven. 
you know, something's going down up there. Yeah, but Nightwing doesn't exist. So something's going on. We're going to find out. That's going to do it for our show, Andrew. Big show, trying to figure out how to use this stuff here. Thanks for joining me today. Tell everybody where they can find you. You can find me on Instagram at Andrew underscore Fantasia and on Twitter at Andrew Fantasia and on the Andrew Fantasia YouTube channel uh, where I talk about movies and stuff. Uh, I might be doing a Batman video there. I'm not sure yet. Uh, I don't do reviews anymore. I'm going to be a little different, so I have to think of something good. Uh, but then you can also find me here uh, where we talk about Marvel, specifically the MCU, on Infinity Rewatch, the podcast. The first one's going to be at the Thursday, the Thursday after it, Debut, the right? Yeah, so the last day of March, I think, because I work Wednesday nights, so I cannot uh, do it right on the same That's day. Good. Yeah. Gives everybody a day to digest it and take it in, and you mm -hmm. can do it. So yeah, look for that show right here. Give them a follow at Andrew Fantasia, um, and that's it for this. Yeah, there you go. That is it for this show. It's Monday has been very manic. Thanks for watching. Thanks for stopping by. And until next time, may you be the master of your own universe. <laughs>